Okay, well, hi, everybody. This is actually almost stranger than my normal Zooms because I can't see any of you. I'm just talking to the, the camera now. But I'm really stoked to get to give you this lesson. Uh, when Mark asked me about doing this, I was like, oh, wow, what a perfect time to get everybody excited about doing some container foodscapes. And this really is the prime season to, you know, get started on your warm season combinations. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I brought a bunch of stuff to demonstrate. And I wanted to first show you one of my cool season, what I call a, a salad pot. This was just um, a, a, like a, a lettuce, arugula, kale mix seeded, seeded directly in soil cube organic compost. I planted this about seven weeks ago, and this has actually already been fully harvested twice. So this is what has grown after multiple harvests. So, you know, for somebody who doesn't want to go all out in vegetable gardening, you don't have to. You can totally just do a couple of containers that, you know, have the opportunity for you to grow something that you love to eat. I, I can't believe how incredibly loud it is here. I hope that you guys aren't actually hearing the, the real life sounds of the Arboretum. <laughs> so let's get started first with like a summer kind of more conventional foodscape combo. And the, the whole idea behind foodscaping is really easy. It's just integrating your traditional ornamentals with the edibles that you love to eat. So the whole thing is to be as practical as possible, grow the food crops that you like to harvest, that you're used to cooking with in the kitchen. Don't grow things that you don't like to eat. There's no point in putting the effort into that. And I am using just like a little three gallon root pouch bag. And these are really nice. What I love about root pouch, these are actually made from recycled water bottles. So, you know, we all, have this you know issue with so much unused plastic in our current world and this is just a really great way for gardeners to kind of take advantage of a resource that's otherwise kind of causing an environmental nightmare and i have filled this about three quarters or a little more than halfway full again with my favorite growing medium this is soil cube organic compost and it's it's not your average compost um for those of you who are tuning in from outside of the Southeast, unfortunately, this is only available in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, but it really is a terrific product. It's very well drained, but it holds up like a perfect amount of humidity and is easier to manage long-term than traditional potting soil because it doesn't dry out as frequently. Now, the idea here is if you're planting something now, the end of April, beginning of May, and you're using a small pot, I would classify a three gallon as a small container. By the 4th of July, you are going to need to think about transplanting anything that you have growing in this. So you're either gonna pot it up into a bigger container or you can divide the plants up and put those into the ground or you know, uh, add them to other pots that you're growing. But I want you to really think realistically we have a very long growing season and it may not be totally the right expectation that something you plant in April is going to look perfect all the way until we have frost in November. So that's usually my plan. Anything that I pot now gets repotted sometime after the 4th of July, usually before August. That way the plants look great. They never get stressed out and I never have to freak out about missing my watering schedule. You know, because hopefully this year we're all gonna get to like go somewhere and leave our houses for a few days. So for this combination, because I'm a tomato enthusiast, I brought one of my favorite tomatoes, a green zebra. And I actually got this plant from Big Bloomers um, about two weeks ago. And I always keep the labels in the container just in case I forget what the variety is, which does happen somewhat frequently. Now with tomatoes, you actually want to remove the bottom couple of leaves. You can see I'm just snapping these off by hand. I'm not ripping them down because you don't wanna, you don't wanna actually like scar the stem. 
but I've done this intentionally because tomatoes are really unique in that you can plant them very deep and they really benefit from the added stem being buried where they will develop another root system. So I'm going to put this actually kind of towards the back of this and I'm digging down all the way to the bottom. So that is going to get planted and it's going to be totally covered with soil up to that bottom leaf once I finish putting the rest of the plants in. Now I have a trick for everyone who deals with animals. And you know, I, I have tons of animals. I live down in Fuquay. Everything is being developed. There's like no farmland anymore. It's really scary. And I have so many deer and groundhogs and rabbits that I really have had to get creative with being able to, to grow food crops incorporated in all of my landscape and not have everything eaten by these animals. So my trick for really growing any summer plants, but especially summer containers, is to always incorporate a plectranthus. And plectranthus are very closely related to coleus. So I brought both with me to be able to show you some of the diversity in the different species and varieties that are available. So plectranthus, you can see, actually has forms that are almost like ground covers or trailing. Um, they're very succulent in nature. There's some beautiful variegated varieties. The key thing with plectranthus is that it has this really strong scent to its foliage and animals absolutely hate it. So all of these did come from big bloomers. I think they have the best selection of both coleus and plectranthus. And for you plant nerds out there, I believe the taxonomists have actually reclassified coleus as a species of plectranthus, just to make it that much more confusing for the rest of us. So I am going to concentrate putting a low growing plectranthus in the front of this pot because I'm thinking about how I'm going to have this oriented. I'm going to need the tomato to be in the back because that is ultimately going to grow on a stake. And then I am going to have this plectranthus here that's going to spill out over the front. And then really, ideally, I could even do a second more upright plectranthus here. And then I can add some flowers of choice. Now, remember, I have told you, this is really a planter that's only meant to live about two months before I re kind of reevaluate how it would be best grown. So I have chosen the Saratoga mix of flowering Nicotiana, and I have some different um, Dianthus Barbados. Is this Dianthus Barbados? I don't know, it's some, some Sweet William type plant. And basically, because these are in four packs, you don't need to overload it, but I'm gonna do one Nicotiana kind of tucked here in the front. And then behind that, to sort of balance the white from the plectranthus, I think I'm gonna choose the white Dianthus to go in. So this seems really full. That's the point. You want it to look like complete when you plant it. But that is also why recognizing that later on in the season, you're going to need to pot this up because all of these things will use every bit of this soil. Now the potting up process is really easy. You're just gonna take them out. If they're really root bound, you can squeeze the roots a bit. These are kind of at their perfect stage. So I don't actually need to do that. Before I plant that ground cover one, I'm gonna fill in with more compost get everything nice and snug, well planted in, and established in here. Now, because I use soil cube, I actually don't use very much fertilizer anymore. And that's one of the big advantages of using a non-traditional potting media. Um, not only does it not drain out as quickly, it holds on to its nutrients more. And so that has really helped me significantly uh, being able to manage. I frequently have around 80, maybe 90 container plants, and that can be a lot of maintenance. So the final step will just be to get this ground cover, the spiller, you know, the thriller, the spiller and the filler. We have established that well with this combo. But the most important thing here is that because of the plectranthus, the deer, rabbits, groundhogs, and even squirrels 
will ultimately leave this tomato alone and they'll leave these other beautiful flowering plants alone. Now, one thing I love about these fabric bags, they have handles so they're easy to move. You can actually settle that soil in. And the final step would be to mulch. I usually use triple shred hardwood. I didn't have any at home, so I didn't bring any. All right, so that's our first container. Now let's think about doing something uh, that's a little more unusual. And in that case, I would like to introduce you to the concept of using a hanging basket to grow some onions. Now I think onions are really good candidates for in-ground growing. They have a lot of components that make them uh, well adapted for helping deter animals. But the bottom line is, if you don't have space, but you like to eat onions, you can grow them in a hanging basket very successfully. So I'm just gonna fill this basket up. Again, same compost. See how neat and tidy I am. Grace is usually not one of my attributes. Thank you. Okay, that's perfect. Now you can grow anything in a hanging basket. And I actually currently have a lot of hanging baskets filled with strawberries. And they're the only strawberries that the really ponies aren't getting into. So I appreciate that. But I have this bag of mixed onions that I had forgotten about. These were intended to go into the ground when I saw them yesterday. I gasped. And I thought, well, this would be a perfect thing to be able to show you just how simple it is. So I'm actually going to plant these relatively densely. And I'm literally just kind of pushing them in so their foliage, if they've already started to grow out, is kind of already exposed. So I am just planting these, um, you know, about an inch apart and I'm kind of swirling them to the middle. And the whole idea behind this is you will eventually get to harvest some onions, but it's gonna be a really pretty foliage display all summer long. And if you don't have a place to hang it, that's okay, because you can always just take these hooks off. You can use this as like a table centerpiece. Um, I very frequently do hanging baskets during the cool season, but I find that they dry out a lot in the summer. So I will actually just take their hangers off and put them in places where they're easier to be able to keep watered. Um, I find that sometimes baskets are up high in the air and I'm, I'm not tall and <laughs> sometimes that's hard to manage. So again, I'm just gonna kind of settle that soil and you have an onion basket ready to be grown. Okay, now, because I am the crazy green lady, and I'm just gonna push this down here, I can't not talk about growing grains. And I really think that grains and containers are like the most practical thing. So let's first of all, start off with the idea of growing your own bird seed. And this is always a concept that people get really excited about. And the two ideal things that you would use for growing your own bird seed, both in containers or in the ground, be millet. And let me show you what millet seed looks like because it's a very small seed and birds love it oh so much. Millet is a warm season grain. So meaning it grows in the frost free months. It really appreciates warm soil. Now the other grain that I recommend for growing, for cultivating a happy bird population is sorghum. And there's a lot of different varieties of sorghum available, including cane sorghum, which is grown for the large canes that are much like sugar cane that can be actually squeezed. And then the sugary liquid is what makes uh, like sorghum syrup. But this variety is specifically grown for the bird seed industry. And here you see that. You probably recognize this from bird seed mixes. And most people have accidentally grown sorghum at one point or another because this is what germinates at the base of your bird feeder. So the process for planting these is again, really ridiculously simple. 
Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna show that I'm not in great shape. I'm gonna lift this bag of soil cube and dump it in, filling it about three quarters of the way. Lord, it's so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> we can't walk while you're doing it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it, inevitably, <laughs> I'm I'm so attached. Some okay, down. there we go. Okay, we're gonna do this, you guys. I told you it's not graceful. It's just okay. I'm making Chris do it. There, I'll hold it open and dig it out with my hands. I had these stacked on top of one another, so they're a little bit more compacted than they, than they should be. <laughs> okay, so that's actually pretty good because we don't actually have to fill this all the way up. So let's see, am I better? Let me move it here. There, bare soil. So we will just take the millet. And I'm a little heavy handed, I will acknowledge that. But you see, I'm just kind of gently scattering that around. And the millet's gonna be about two and a half to three foot tall when it flowers. Now I really wanna live on the wild side. I'm gonna do a millet sorghum combo because I know that this is gonna be the thing that like all the birds in my neighborhood basically lose their minds over. So I'm just seeding the two of those together. You can see it's pretty dense. This is gonna be a very full, Poaceae display. Remember, all grains are in the grass family. So you don't need to be afraid to grow them. They're really no different than, you know, the ornamental grasses that you're used to growing. And now I'm going to add just a couple of inches of compost on top of that. And these will ultimately germinate usually 10 to 12 days, depending on temperatures. Considering we have 90 predicted for tomorrow, these are going to germinate pretty quickly. And that will just get watered in, placed into a full sun area, and it will be one of the more dynamic, interesting, wildlife friendly containers for the summer. But I kind of saved the best, or what I think is the best for last. And that is the idea of growing your own rice. And honestly, I called rice the mystifier in gardening with grains because when I tell people that I grow my own rice, they look at me like I'm from Mars. But I learned about this from my good friend, Dewey, who is a pharmacist in Holly Springs. And he's originally from Laos. And he grows a huge patch of rice every year in his backyard. And so he was the one who first shared seeds with me and uh, taught me these cultivation practices. And what I have found, especially for beginning rice growers, the easiest approach is just to get a pot with no holes. And you know that you can find these everywhere. Like all the box stores and garden centers carry plastic pots that you would have to drill holes into to be able to do any of these other container combinations. The exception to that rule is rice because rice is very tolerant of saturation. So what I love is that I can do this on my wooden deck and I don't have to worry about the wood rotting because there's not water that's dripping out of the bottom every single day when I irrigate. Now, this is a container that I'm very fond of uh, because it's on wheels. So I actually picked this up at Ikea and um, it doesn't matter the color. I do find that white pots reflect some of the summer heat. So uh, that should be a benefit so that the wood don't actually scald. Do a demo. I regret not buying 20 of these, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so this is, I think, about a seven gallon size. And I also grow rice in 10 gallon pots. Smaller pots are a bigger challenge as the season moves on, but you can always start them small and then transplant them through the summer. By the end of the year though, remember, the rice will root through the entire container the whole thing will be nothing but roots. Uh, it's a really remarkable thing to see how much biomass grains grow just from their root development. Now I have this already filled uh, about like 80% of the way to the top. And the process here is you're gonna scatter 
rice seed that's intended to be grown. And this looks different than the rice seed that you buy at the grocery store, okay? Rice seed from the grocery store doesn't germinate. I have tried, so you don't have to make that same mistake. You actually have to get rice seed that is intended for growth development. And I really like to scatter this quite densely because I want this just to be a solid mass of grass, just like an ornamental clump. What I have found is that my kitties really love these grass pots, these grain pots, and they will often like make a little spot in the center where they end up like perching, where they're completely surrounded by all the vegetation. Now for this, it's no different. You're just gonna cover it again with a couple of inches of compost. This will germinate in place. And again, at this time of year, it's usually under two weeks when you start to see the germination and they just thrive through the heat and humidity. Um, I just can't say enough, especially about uh, sorghum and rice being really well adapted for this particular climate. And I think they're so ornamental that they absolutely deserve a place at your house. So there we are. I can't wait to share updates with everybody as all these things grow out. Oh, hang on. So I did want to tell you all that I am having an open garden next Saturday, May 8th from noon to 4 p.m. And I actually am going to have all the seeds that I talked about today available. I have also pre-germinated a lot of these plants in containers so that you could just take them home and get started on your own foodscape containers. So again, that is May 8th from noon to 4 p.m. No registration, free admission. You can get more details about it, including my address from my website, greegrows.com. And you can always hit me up on Instagram or YouTube. I am Bree, like the cheese, the plant lady. <laughs> oh, good. Do we have questions? I hope so. Okay, good. I should say like for watering, you know, it's generic to say water as needed, but basically when temperatures start getting to 90 on a regular basis, I water all of my pots every single day. And back in the pre-pandemic life, I had my neighborhood children water all of my pots while I was traveling. And the rule of thumb at my house, especially in the summer, is 30 seconds per pot. Now with rice growing in a pot with no holes, you'll be able to see if there's if it's already saturated and there's standing water, you don't need to water it. But rice is really interesting when it dries out, the leaves curl. So you'll know immediately that you need to, you know, turn the hose on and, and give it some hydration. Okay, we're gonna do a quick little microphone test to see if I got Bree's old microphone working. Linda Johnson, can you give me a little thumbs up if you can hear me well? Hey, excellent. Well, the helicopter is back for the fourth time. And it's really hard to think as that thing flies over. So I need to give Bree a really good uh, it's thumbs like up because I, or something. I don't know how she Crazy. did it. I, I couldn't think of anything when that thing flew over. But we do have a lot of questions. I'm going to um, uh, skip where Soil Cube is come from, comes from because we'll put that in the chat a million times. Um, Bree, can you repeat what kind of sorghum that was? Oh, yeah. So let me actually give you the proper name. So this sorghum is called, oh, sorry, WGF. And to be honest, I'm not sure what that stands for. And I buy a lot of my grain seeds from this company, Hancock Seeds. So they're out of Florida. And what I've found, I can't believe, oh, no, the rice. Oh. <sighs> <laughs> it's so windy, you guys. Uh, what I found is they do a really good job with grains specific for the heat and humidity of the Southeast. So over the years, I've purchased grain seed from a lot of suppliers, but a lot of them are more for like zone five. And we don't have a lot in common with zone five. So I try to find Southern sources. Shirley has asked if the soil cube soil is good for raised planters. Yes, it's really ideal for 
for raised beds. Uh, it's also great for top dressing your landscape and your lawns. And I actually do all my seed starting in it now as well. So it's really a very versatile soil mix that's quite unique. And I love that um, I can use it like season after season. So it's long lasting. And you just mentioned where you got the sorghum from. Suzanne's wondering where you get other seed from. So um, I buy from a lot of seed suppliers, but Baker Creek heirloom seed is always at the top of my list. Uh, sustainable seeds, Renee's high mowing, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, so true seeds which is a north carolina based seed supplier we're really lucky to be living in an era where we have awesome seed companies that you can order from from the comfort of your couch <laughs> and chris has an interesting question she's wondering if you can start a cool season planter like the one that you have here and keep it in more of a shaded environment it's a little bit cooler for the next couple of months and then write it off oh maybe so i have tried zone bending as far as like using the north side of my house to cultivate seeded greens things like lettuce and chard and kale and to some to some degree it's worked for the most part they tend to bolt really early yeah. so it's not that you can't do it it's that you probably want to reseed every 20 to 30 days so it's just not going to be as long lasting as when you wait until fall and those crops will go through the entire winter into spring, but it's not impossible. And for those that don't know what bolting is, it is? Oh, bolting means um, the physiology of the plant is reacting to air temperatures and it's like causing the plant to flower and set seed because it's um, telling itself that it's going to die because of the climate conditions. So it's, it's kind of like a stress reactor. And that is often happening. Like I've seen here at the Arboretum, all of the mustards have bolted in there and flower and they're quite beautiful, but they get very bitter once they establish flowers. So they're not as edible in nature. And Kelly is wondering, does millet and or sorghum uh, self seed and spread? in a home landscape? I get that question a lot. Thank you for asking that. So in my case, I have not had any of these grains become invasive in any capacity. Now, I think in part, I am intentionally going out and harvesting at least some of the seed, but to be perfectly frank, the birds will clean you out. Like you've never seen birds behave quite the way you will when you grow these things and they will make it so you don't have any seeds so it's like impossible for it to self sow but the key thing with these grains is to recognize these are warm season so if if they fall to the ground they actually die when the temperatures get cold and then same thing with cool season grains which i'm growing right now which i wanted to bring some of those pots but they're just too big and too heavy but they're filled with barley and oats and wheat and rye, um, none of those will tolerate the summer conditions. So even if you let them go to seed and fall to the ground, they'll germinate and then kind of peter out because it's too hot and too humid for them to be able to, to, be able to continue growing. And Chris commented that onions are a cool season plant and is wondering where you're going to put that at home. You can put that in a little bit of shade for um So that's coolness. a very important observation. Yes. And that's actually in part why I decided to do it as a hanging basket. My hanging baskets go on my front porch under the eave in shade and they're in eastern exposure. So the little bit of sun they do get is just in the morning. So I'm able to zone bend to a degree. Um, last year, I did an experiment growing. I planted onions every six weeks all year round. And it was really amazing that even the onions that I planted in the middle of summer, you know, they grew, they kind of went dormant during this, the heat. And then they, they reestablished and came back with great vigor in September and October. So I actually am going to make the bold statement here that if you like me, bought some onions and lost track of them and just found them that you can actually plant them any time of the year. And at some point you will have a harvest to be able to bring in and use in the kitchen. And Kathy's wondering if your hanging basket is anything special. Um, is there a particular reason why you like that one and what kind of drainage hole does it have? Just So that is also a good question. Um, 
I bought this because it was the only hanging basket at Lowe's that didn't have plants already in it. <laughs> um, I find the pre-planted hanging baskets aren't as sturdy of plastic. And I really liked this one because it actually has four things that it attaches to and it's metal. So I just think it all together looks better than the plastic. Um, I really like reusing stuff. Like I don't like this disposable world that we're living in. So my purpose for buying these and making my own hanging basket combos was really just to help reduce the, you know, one-time use plastic that most hanging baskets are that you buy pre-planted. And Maggie, oh, drainage oh. holes. She asked. They came, it came with drainage holes and it looks like there's two really big ones and then four small ones. So I do know that when I water this, it drains out. <laughs> <really efficiently. laughs> Maggie is wondering, um, how do you harvest your sorghum and millet? Okay. So actually sorghum and millet are uh, easier than some of the cool season grains because they don't have the same um, amount of chafe attached. So basically you're just cutting the seed heads off. And in the case of sorghum, you're, you can just wash it and then you can eat it. So sorghum, if you're not familiar, is actually a gluten-free grain. It's a really wonderful nutty flavor. You can cook it just like rice, essentially like with some water and just steam it for about 20 or 25 minutes. Um, I actually included 13 recipes in Gardening with Grains to give people examples of how you could use your homegrown products in contrast to what you'd buy at the store. And that includes vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free options. Now, the millet is a little more complicated because it kind of has a, a fuzzy seed head. Like, it really looks like when I was growing up, what we called Timothy grass. And so you just want to let that seed dry out for a few days. And then you can just tap it on the side of a bucket. And the seed will actually just come out of that, like, more ornamental casing. Uh, for the most part, the birds steal all of my millet. Like I have <laughs> harvested almost zero seed from my own crop because the birds always get to it before me, but that's fine. Cause that's why I'm growing it. And, you know, I've never had as much bird activity as I do now that I've started incorporating these things into my home landscape where, you know, the, the sorghum can grow like 14 foot tall. I don't have to worry. My cats cannot jump that high. So I feel like it's even safer than having a bird feeder out where I'm kind of training the birds to come to a place where my naughty cats might do something bad. Oh. <laughs> we got a question here is uh, someone is wondering how you protect the rice pots from animals. And then you plant uh, plectranthus in it. Um, I mean, yeah, the thing is animals don't tend to want to eat the rice foliage. So I haven't had issues with animals browsing on the rice other than birds stealing the rice seed, which isn't going to happen until you know the days start getting shorter. It's a photoperiodic relationship where the seeds are formed. So that's usually after Labor Day, before Halloween, that like September, October time. Um, I have not had any animal browse problems with my rice. Um, the thing is with rice, especially if you're growing in a pot with no holes, it's going to be challenging for you to plant pair because there's not a lot of other plants that want to live in that bog condition. So you could grow it with like Lysimachia or, or Creeping Jenny. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of advantage to combining rice just because if you sow it the way I showed you, there isn't going to be room for anything else. But certainly the plectranthus has been my summer solution for animal brows. My winter solution tends to be onions and garlic. Uh, but you're not really traditionally planting garlic at this time of year. Uh, but so a great foliage option to deter animals is this plectranthus. And maybe we'll have to have an encore presentation of my webinar, Keep the Animals Out. <laughs> which is two hours jam-packed of creative solutions for dealing with critters. <laughs> Kathy has asked, do the root pouches have drainage holes or drainage? So the interesting thing about um, all these fabric bags, including root pouches, 
they're a permeable material. So they don't actually have physical holes in them, but the entire thing drains. So when you water it, you'll see water actually like pouring out the sides. So, you know, that's the thing you kind of can't fail with these. No one should ever have root rot in a uh, fabric bag unless you are like growing this inside a pond, <laughs> which isn't really what I would recommend, but no. So these, they're just entirely permeable. And Chris has asked, have you tried uh, growing catnip as an insect deterrent? Well, I grow catnip, but mostly because I like to see my cats um, eat it and, and do silly things. Um, I don't know. I mean, it might work as an insect deterrent. Um, I am kind of of the mind because I have a couple of tick-borne illnesses that I'm having to navigate life with that I put on sunscreen every day and I put on real bug spray every day uh, just because I'd rather not deal with another tick-borne illness. Um, so I don't, I'm probably not the best person to ask about natural repellents because I feel like I've given up hope on that. <laughs> so Valerie has asked, can the cell cube be mixed with other regular potting soils or is it just not recommended because you just want to use it straight? So you can mix it with other potting soils. I did an experiment and actually wrote a blog all about this. It's on their webpage where I compared normal potting soil, 50-50 mix of potting soil, soil cube and soil cube in all of my different containers. And everything was, everything lived. The, the straight potting soil was so much more work because it dries out so fast. But the really amazing thing was how much more vigorous the plants were in the straight soil cube. So I don't bother anymore. I, I just, I, I don't bother buying anything else. Um, it, I find it's much easier. I typically get the big one cubic yard bag. I brought these because they're mobile and it's nice that they do sell one cubic foot. Uh, but I don't really, again, I don't like all this plastic waste. So I really like being able to use the large bag. And now they have a buyback program where every bag that comes in, um, $10 gets donated to a community garden charity. So, you know, it, it's sort of helping, you know, helping keep everything going together and encouraging less waste overall. And so that was really a big part of why I gravitated towards the big yellow bag to begin with. The fact that their soil is better than anything I have ever experienced is a huge bonus. <laughs> uh, Robin has asked, where did you get the rice seed? So I also got that from Hancock Seed and you can find it occasionally from online sources, but I've been getting a lot of reports that like Baker Creek is sold out and Park Seed is sold out, Johnny's is sold out. So I think word is out that rice is cool. And you know, the silver lining of the pandemic is that everybody's gardening now. And so I will have rice seed available. Actually, I, I packaged it yesterday um, at my open house. They'll be available for purchase. Um, and we have some on the ground now too. Oh, right. Well, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go well, through and read. pick up all that seed. <laughs> it fell on the ground with the wind. That would be an entertaining outtake. I think it's those helicopters. I think they're making all the wind. And by, by the way, it, they just flew over. It was two. Yes. I didn't look up before. It was two helicopters. So lot, lots of noise. Um, Charles is wondering, have you ever tried a black cow for growing tomatoes? So I have, um, and I don't want to talk badly about that black cow, but I actually acquired some significant diseases as a result of using that. Um, I don't trust I don't trust compost that's straight animal based. So, what is unique about soil cube in contrast is that it's it's derived of wheat straw and grass clippings and cow manure. So it's much better draining. And um, yeah, I I I. I have a couple of areas where I loaded it up with black cow and now I can't grow tomatoes in those places at all. So, um, yeah, that probably isn't the experience for everyone. That's just my experience. And, <laughs> and for the next one, I know you've covered it in your classes. Val's wondering, is it better to grow tomatoes in the ground or in a big container? 
Well, it kind of depends on your level of getting your feelings hurt mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe also your soil quality. So I live in a tobacco field and I have root, not nematodes. And if I grow heirloom tomatoes in the ground, they inevitably get nematodes and I don't get much yield. So I can grow grafted tomatoes, which are grafted on nematode resistant rootstock in ground, but for the most part, I grow all of mine in containers and in hydroponic tanks. Um, tomatoes are really problematic in that they have so many diseases and we have the exact climate that enables all stages of every disease to persist. So uh, my generally my recommendation, just if you only wanna have a couple is to grow them in pots and you know keep them in an area where you, know, you can shield the container from the really hot late day sun, that'll help reduce sun scald and make sure you have them placed somewhere convenient to water. Tomatoes are 90% water. You cannot skip a day when you grow tomatoes. They need constant attention. They are absolutely the biggest divas that I, I'm not really sure why we, we are like so emotionally connected to tomatoes considering how much effort they can require. This is coming from me. I have 50 different varieties of heirlooms that will also be available during the open house. So if you want to join the crazy tomato club, come visit me. So, so, the, next, so the next thing in the, uh, in the chat actually isn't a question. It's a, a, a nice compliment. It's someone that says it's the first time experiencing one of your programs. Oh. And she thought it was wonderful. And uh, that reminded me that we do have Brie on the calendar on Tuesday, May 25th in the evening at 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. She's doing a class titled Growing Rice and Other Summer Grains. So it'll be much more in-depth than tonight's program if you want to learn a little bit more. Let's and see that some pod more that I just did will absolutely be one of the examples that's included in that class. <laughs> So Chris asked, is catnip the plectranthus for insects? Oh, uh, I, you know, I don't know. Like I've never noticed that catnip, like I've never noticed that it deters mosquitoes. Like actually one plant that I do use, um, and sometimes just like, I just crush the leaves and just have them in my hands is Calicarpa Americana. And it's really interesting because it has like, more properties than DEET for deterring mosquitoes, but they can't figure out how to stabilize it to like actually put it into a spray formula for us to buy. So I actually usually will go out into my garden, especially at night, you know, seven o'clock when the mosquitoes and uh, those little like fly things, those gnats are out so badly. And I just crushed calicarpal leaves and I kind of like rub them on my shoulders and I might put them in my pockets. And I have found that that actually does help. Now, I don't know about its properties for ticks. And for me, I'm just really like, like I don't want any more tick bites ever again. Um, and so I, I wear off deep woods for, for, the tick, for the tick situation. So I've, I've heard the calicarpa many times in many ways. I can't stand the smell of calicarpa. I love the shrub, but oh, it's I don't like pruning the plant. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, I don't know if plectranthus works on insects because I haven't, again, I haven't tried, but like the smell of this, it's so terrible. And like, they call this sometimes Cuban oregano. I've, I have asked people and they're like, no, no, we don't use that in Cuban cooking. But I think it actually is native to Cuba and like the Caribbean islands. Um, but it's, I, I mean, I don't think you, you're not going to get hurt from eating it, but like, no. you're not going to like it no. either. So yeah, I, I just discovered this plectranthus trick about three years ago. And for one thing, the plants are really cool. They have really pretty texture. The fact that it, it keeps the deer from eating like every single plant in my, in my pots is like maybe one of the greatest discoveries of all time. So it would work in the ground too. I grow tons of plectranthus in my gardens mixed in with plants. It's not just for containers. So since we've been talking about that plectranthus quite a bit, the next question is a good one. Joyce was uh, asking what the names of the plants in the first pot were again. Okay. So 
And I, one thing about big bloomers is they, they haven't been putting name labels in. My nomenclature is a little off, but I think I'm probably going to not, not do this correctly. I, for some reason, I want to call this Plectranthus argenteus, but actually don't think that's accurate. But I have two different species of Plectranthus. Oop, I just popped that one you off. You can root it. Oh, it will root. It will go home and be rooted today. God forbid I waste a piece of plant. Then I did a like a, a dianthus, a sweet William, and also a Nicotiana. Now, both of these don't tend to persist all the way through summer. And so that's okay because by the middle of summer, I'm going to be reevaluating this pot and probably taking each thing out, putting the putting the tomato into a larger container. Um, and you know, replacing the ornamentals. So I find these are really good for the beginning half of the warm season, but not the July, August, September component. Um, I don't know if that's just me. I grow a lot of different types of Nicotiana, but these, these small kind of annual flowering forms do better for me as a spring crop than a full summer crop. Uh, Kathy is, uh, has another question about the root pouches. She's wondering, do you get those locally or is that just an online product? Uh, yeah, you know, I know there are garden centers that carry these. Um, I, Soil Cube actually sells them. So I think they have them in their stores, which they sell, like they have a carry store and they're at the state farmer's market. Um, AM Leonard carries like 50 different sizes of this particular brand. Um, and I grow in lots of different fabric bags. I just think the root pouch is really unique. They have really sturdy handles. I like things that I can move around. And I really like the recycling of water bottles. And that's very unique to their product. So I know when I've Googled root pouch, AM Leonard is usually the first online source to pop up. But I know 100% if you go to a super sod store, they have these available for purchase. And I'll go ahead and answer it. Chris has asked if uh, the plant that Mark's mentioned for keeping insects away is the Calicarpa, Calicarpa Americana. Yes, it is. And it's a beautiful plant. I love it to death. A fantastic plant. I just hold my Birds breath when I burn it. Birds love to eat its berries too. So it, it has so many functions. Um, that's just one that I kind of think you can't go wrong with. And I'm amazed at how shade tolerant my Calicarpas have become. Like, you know, when I first planted my garden 10 years ago, it was full sun. But I planted a lot of trees and now I'm getting a ton of shade. And it's amazing how like viburnums and calicarpa have totally adapted from full sun to almost full shade. Judy is wondering if the Nicotiana attract white flies. Um, yes, I believe Nicotianas do. And maybe white flies are what, what kill mine by the middle of summer. I am not a, a pesticide micromanager. Um, my solution generally for white flies, mealybugs, aphids, and really it's only if it's an extreme case is, you know, like I said, I'm not emotionally attached to this. So like I have about a six, six week love affair and then, and then I'm over it. Um, so if I have to yank it early because of bugs, that does not hurt my feelings, but you can use insecticidal soap. And I know I, I share this in like every one of my webinars, but you can also make your own insecticidal soap using uh, like Castile soap because that, that has more fatty acids. And it's just one tablespoon of Castile soap to um, one gallon of water. And uh, you can add two tablespoons of vegetable oil or really any oil. Um, and that will act as the surfactant to make it stick better and it'll be more effective. But that's just a really easy, like non-toxic, you can spray it on food crops. It's not going to hurt anything, but it will eliminate some of your uh, problem insects, including white flies. Hey, Chris is one, or asked, are Plectranthus easily grown from seed? You know, I, um, they, they should in theory be. I have never done that. I've always no. asexually propagated these. Um, so the ones have the Brie has are cultivars. You would lose their their traits most likely if you grew them from seeds. So you yeah. want to do them from cuttings. And almost no plant is easier than growing 
uh, plectranthus from from a, from a cutting. You just put it in soil and water it, and it it'll root. It'll root. Like you don't yeah. have to have a mist chamber. Um, you know, it's interesting. These are actually native to the southern hemisphere, and so they often don't flower early enough to potentially set ripe seed in our climate because they're frost tender. So because they they bloom with short days. Um, that may be a contributing factor as to why seed grown plectranthus isn't more available. Or like, I just have never had that question before. I, would, I, I, would I can just... tell you, and I'm a curious person. I actually never even thought about it, but now I'm going to go out of my way to try and see if I can get some seed just to see what would happen when I germinate It's probably it. just like growing coleus from seed. You I, can grow coleus yes, from seed. No idea what you're going to get, but it's kind of fun. But you don't get really cool cultivars that way. Yeah. I mean, what the heck? I grow, I try to grow every variety that I can find. And I'm always on the hunt for more plectranthus. So if anybody knows of a source other than big bloomers, please let me know because I'm a <laughs> thousand percent addicted to these. <laughs> and I, if I could have 500, I would feel like, you know, that would make my, my year that would make 2021. Would that make you the crazy plectranthus lady then? I, you know, I think I on a roll. I might as well <laughs> stick with it. Like I currently, if you want to see my grain experiences over the last five years, all you have to do is Google the hashtag crazy grain lady. It turns out there's no one else in the world that wants to be known by that title except me. <laughs> So Bree does have her own social media, but Bree did a Friends of the Arboretum lecture. Seems like an eon ago after this last year. I forget when it was, but it was probably shortly after your book came out. And her lecture is available on our YouTube channel. If you haven't visited there before, that is linked on our website. At the bottom right side, just click on the YouTube icon and, and hunt it down. There's a Friends of the Arboretum lecture uh, playlist. So just find it. It's there. It's a good lecture. And that You were my book debut, actually. Yes, yes. Book launch. <laughs> So that takes care of all the questions in the chat, believe it or not. I think we wore them all out, Bree. Awesome. So thank, thank you for being here today, Bree. And thank you, everyone that uh, joined us online. We were so happy to have you. And uh, we uh, look forward to many more programs. And hopefully we'll see you next week for our Peony and Iris plants, or Plant uh, Lovers Tour. We'll see you then. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Enjoyed it. You're welcome. Thanks for coming Thanks in today. Thank you so much. It was Thank awesome. You. It was wonderful.